as you guys know, I've started a series on the um, story of the Iberian crypto Jews. And um, as you guys know, it'll be over several weeks. Um, this week will be our second week, and I'm going to talk about the golden age of Spanish Jewry. And just to reca recap what we've done so far, so the last week was a bit of an introduction into what we've been talking about. We talked about the potential origins, because um, we're not exactly sure um, when the sort of, you know, when, when the Spanish Jews first arrived in Spain. Um, there are a number of options. If you look at the archaeological and sort of textual evidence from various sources, it pointed to a time in the Roman Empire. Whereas if you look at some of the traditions and some of the possible interpretations of um, Tarshish, for example, in the Old Testament, um, we could get to a, a, um, a starting point much earlier in the first exile or even the first temple period as well. So um, interesting to think about when they started, but at the very least, it was at the um, during the Roman Empire. We also reviewed the fate of these Jews under the control of the Romans, but also after the um, Visigothic kingdoms, the sort of European tribes took over Spain after the Roman Empire fell. And it was often a mixed bag, but often ended quite badly for the Jews, particularly towards the end. And we've also reviewed the Islamic conquests of Iberia and how the Pact of Umar discriminated against the Jews, but also gave them rights. And this is where we left off last week. I just want to say um, again that um, the slides today will not have the references. I know there'll be some interesting things people, people want to look up. I definitely encourage you to do so. I'm happy for people to use the slides, but um, for people to really um, you know, get the full story, I mean, I recommend either um, doing your own research into the things I talk about. I'm just trying to give a bit of an overview through these presentations. Um, but if people are really interested as well and don't want to sort of Google everything, um, I'm preparing a written account of the story in much more detail, which I'll make available at some point in the future, hopefully soon. So um, I hope you're um, ready to go through really was um, really not only the golden age of Spanish Jewry, but arguably a golden age in the entire Jewish diaspora. Um, so briefly, um, just we're in the time period of the early eighth century. Um, the Visigothic kingdoms have been pushed out of Spain. Um, the Islamic um, conquerors, they essentially within three years from 711 to 714 have conquered most of the Iberian Peninsula only the far north where the mountains stopped them did they um, have to stop. Um, and this was the setting um, which the Golden Age was about to take off from. Now, in terms of you know, just rough time frames, it's debatable how long the um, Golden Age actually lasts for. Definitely from the 8th to 11th centuries, so from the 700s to the 10 hundreds, um, with you know possible extension a couple hundred years after that, 12th and 13th centuries as well. Um, that could be considered part of the Golden Age as well. And that took place those two centuries, mostly in, in Christian Spain. Um, that was um, a period when the Christian army started to push the Muslim armies back towards the south. So a lot of that was in Christian Spain. And they were actually quite, um, you know, did quite well in, in Christian Spain as well. But in Muslim Spain, it was definitely where they had the pinnacle and had the highest degree of success. By the 14th century, the situation had... Um, indeed far worse for the Jews, and um, it was mostly a Christian Iberian Peninsula at this point. So definitely we're talking about, you know, at least 300 years, possibly up to 500 years when this lasted. And why the Golden Age? So why is this sort of period of time for the Spanish Jews and the Portuguese Jews, you know, why is this period of time, you know, considered the Golden Age of, you know, of Jewish civilization, really? So a few reasons. Um, for diaspora standards, um, Jews actually had some rights and privileges. So a lot of people talk about the Golden Age as being a utopia of multicultural existence and paradise. It definitely wasn't that. Um, the um, sort of Muslim overlords, um, the Moors, they definitely discriminated against the Jews and the Christians who were under their rule, but they also were protected with their own rights as minorities under the Pact of Umar. Um, and what was really helpful as well was often the, the restrictions were not heavily enforced um, for long periods. So, for example, technically under the Pact of Umar, um, churches and synagogues were not allowed to be repaired once they were damaged. However, this you know, happened quite a lot. So they actually were often allowed to um, repair their places of worship, depending on the ruler. Um, Jews were also allowed to study religious texts, not only to study them personally, but also to set up academies of Jewish, Jewish learning to teach 
large classes of Jewish students. And what this allowed to happen was increasing numbers of Jews were educated in the Torah, in the Talmud, in religious texts, and this created a sort of a melting pot of ideas, a melting pot of learning, and this was a perfect sort of situation, a perfect groundwork to be able to, you know, support new ideas and new thinking and really help Jewish, you know, Jewish um, culture, but Jewish scholarship flourish. And also, Jews were given a lot of freedom in secular matters as well. Jews were allowed to conduct business relatively freely, um, with very few restrictions on the scope of their business and who they can do business with. And that was really important because if Jews were on a level, play level playing field with um, the rest of the world, Jews had absolutely huge advantage in business. So. Um, I know there's a stereotype going around, which has gone around for hundreds of years, that Jews are good at business and like business. Um, well, look, I can say for the, you know, from the golden age point of view, definitely Jews had an advantage in when it came to business, and for three main reasons. Firstly, it was um, there was language. Jews were usually multilingual, at least two languages, if not three. Uh, many Jews in those days spoke Arabic, Latin, and a bit of Hebrew as well, and this is compared to the Gentiles who mostly just spoke their one language. Of course, there were Gentiles who were very well versed in different languages, but um, Jews had a high proportion. In fact, the majority of Jews were multilingual, as the majority of Gentiles were um, only familiar with one language. That was one thing. Secondly, Jews were well versed and well acquainted with abstract thinking, probably from like studying the Torah, studying the Jewish texts, which every Jewish male had to do. So even like, you know, common Jewish, you know, you know, sort of the common Jewish man was actually quite, you know, well versed in complex thinking, complex reasoning from abstract ideas, which are not necessarily tangible hand to hand ideas. And that's a huge advantage when, you know, dealing with concepts and business ideas and um, money and things like that. So, uh, again, huge advantage compared to Gentiles who often didn't have the same level of scholarship. And also, Jews often had international contacts, often from their compatriots in diaspora as well. So, combine these three things. Um, again, very, very hard to compete, um, you know, other, other, you know, other businessmen from other nations found it very hard to compete with Jewish businessmen because they were just in some, you know, the three most important aspects of business, the thinking, the contacts and the communication, Jews had massive advantages. So again, this made the Jewish community incredibly wealthy and unusual for our diaspora, Jews were usually middle class. So in other parts of the diaspora, in particular Europe, um, there were obviously rich Jews as well and middle class Jews, but the, you know, there was a large proportion of the Jewish community, which was um, very poor and des almost destitute, which had to be supported by, um, you know, sort of wealthier Jews. But in the Spanish and Portuguese kingdoms in, during the Golden Age, there were very few poor Jewish peasants. Um, they were mostly middle class, so people like doctors, merchants, traders, uh, financiers, you know, those sort of professional jobs we would consider today. Um, and also quite a few of them were in the nobility and the royal courts. So we could actually have very high levels of wealth and power. So again, unusually successful for diaspora standards. And also Jews excelled in other secular matters as well. Um, for example, medicine and, and, and science in general um, was a, a very heavily dominated Jewish domain. Um, poetry as well. So interesting. So we don't really think about poetry very much these days, but poets were the equivalent of, you know, I would say Hollywood rock stars or Hollywood actors in their day. Um, they often had international followings and obviously, obviously there were no movies, no song, well, no recorded songs anyway. So people had to find a way to entertain themselves. And one of the ways they did this was poetry. So if you're a good poet, you had an international following and we'll, we'll actually talk about someone who did have such a following, you know, later on in the video. Um, Jews also were very involved in literature and linguistics. In particular, what the Sephardim really contributed to was developing the Hebrew language. Now, um, ever since the sort of Jews were exiled again from, from their land, um, Hebrew had ceased to be a lingua franca. It was it ceased to be a language that Jews used every day. Of course, you know, Jews used it for the study of religious texts, um, such as the Torah, um, but there was no development of the language. There was no sort of, um, you know, new literature in the language 
pretty much you know until this time but with the you know rise of poetry in in iberia in iberia at this time um a lot of the Sephardim um were excellent poets in the hebrew language who actually helped to develop some of the hebrew language um to a great degree you know under their tutelage so again um we owe them a great debt in not only preserving the hebrew language but also developing it somewhat as well and apart from hebrew poetry there's also arabic and latin poetry as well and Jews were also excellent diplomats. Now, again, I think aided by the abstract thinking and linguistic skills, Jews were excellent diplomats and able to negotiate, able to reason with um, different parties, and they were often employed by royal courts for this service alone. Uh, it was a very important job in those days, as it remains today, diplomacy. So you saw lots of, um, you know, as far as even government. Now, um, now that we sort of had a brief overview of sort of, you know, why the Jews were so successful in the Golden Age and um, sort of what they were successful in, I want to really focus on, again, very, very, very brief, cannot do this justice, but very brief overviews of some of the key personalities of the Golden Age. And just to get, you know, I've, tr I've tried to pick a few who were sort of covered different, who had strengths in sort of different areas to, to give you a breadth of, uh, idea of the breadth of the expertise and the success that these, these Jews had. And, um, you know, again, way too short a summary, but this will have to do given the time we've got. So the first one I want to talk about is someone called Judah Halevi. Um, he uh, was born in 1075, died in 1141. He was originally born in sort of Muslim Spain, but he sort of moved between Muslim and Christian parts of Spain um, due to sort of sporadic persecution that he faced. He was a really successful poet and physician. Um, he, uh, he's, he's really known for a few things. He's known for his poetry, really. He's known as being a, a, a really, really good poet. In fact, such, so, such a good poet. He had an international following. Um, he eventually tired of being in Spain. He actually eventually, um, left Spain and was going towards the Holy Land, uh, the Holy Land of Israel. And he stopped in Egypt. Now, apparently, the story goes, he had such a warm welcome in Egypt, he didn't want to go back all the way to Israel, or he was prevented from going back, who knows, but he actually stayed in Egypt the rest of his life. He apparently was, you know, welcomed like a rock star, and, you know, didn't, you know, he didn't leave Egypt for the rest of his life. He also um, contributed in religious study as well. He authored a religious um, philosophical work called the Kuzari, which he seeks to explore aspects of Jewish philosophy. I want to sort of read to you one of his poets. It's close to my heart. I really love this poem. You know, actually, before I started studying, you know, the history of Sephardim and the crypto Jews, I wasn't a big fan of poetry. But just reading some of the poetry that some of these guys wrote, uh, actually, really speaking speaks to me. Like, really, even with you know the passage of almost a thousand years and the passage of different languages and translation of different languages, it's it still speaks to me. This one's called the Physician's Prayer. Um, it was translated by Nina Salomon in the early 20th century. It reads, uh, or part of it reads, My God, heal me and I shall be healed. Let not thine anger be kindled against me so that I be consumed. My medicines are of thee, whether good or evil, whether strong or weak. It is thou that who shall choose, not I. Of thy knowledge is the evil and the fair. Not upon my power of healing I rely. Only for thine healing do I watch. Uh, it's something that's actually sort of encouraging me to, you know, continue with my own medical career, but with a faith-centered focus, which, you know, Judah Halevi obviously had. So really inspiring for any of you medical people who are watching this video, um, as it, uh, and I hope it is, um, has been inspiring as it was for me. So another of the personalities, is uh, I, I really like, respect this one. His, his name is Kastai Ibn Shaprut. Um, we don't have you know exact figures of when he lived, but he was about 60 years old when he died. He was born in 915, the 915 in Jaén. I think that's right. It's not Jaén. I think it's Jaén, Spain. Uh, he was a great biblical scholar in his own right, and also a physician to the caliph. And the caliph at the time was Abdar Rahman III of Cordoba. Um, however, he was really well known for his diplomacy. So there were many different examples of really impressive um, diplomacy, and so. Sort of, Impressive ways he was able to use his charm, his intellect, and his his nerve to um, sort of affect some quite important treaties, for example, on behalf of the of the of the caliph. Um, but it's probably his most well known for um, for a correspondence with the king of Khazaria. Now, um, there's a lot of uh, things that people say about Khazaria um, at the time. 
some of them used to discredit you know the, the Jewish you know, so the Jewish ancestry by saying oh you know all Ashkenazi Jews are descended from Slavic tribes um, in Khazaria that's definitely not true um, however there definitely was a tribe so sort of, I mean not a tribe more like a kingdom in the sort of eastern Slavic land sort of southern Russia today called Khazaria and apparently from what we know they converted to Judaism um, probably a very superficial conversion but um, um, for political reasons perhaps the perhaps as a sort of you know to act as a power, a power balance between Christianity and Islam the kingdom converted to Judaism or the the rulers did and when Hasla ibn Shapur got hold of this he actually tried to communicate with them he wrote a letter which he entrusted with a, a messenger to take to um, Khazaria it was obviously, obviously quite far from from Iberia at the time so quite a feat to even get the letter to arrive there especially as we, there were probably no um, ports and no sort of major coastline um, to sort of make it easier by sea and allegedly the Khazaria the, the rule of Khazaria actually replied to Hasai ibn Shapirut and they started an interesting correspondence um, it was quite a short-lived correspondence because Khazaria was soon sort of reabsorbed into the Slavic kingdoms um, after they were invaded um, but again very interesting um, you know very interesting episode of medieval diplomacy who knows what it would have been so um, also I just want to um, really just quote what this um, this Arab historian Ibn Hayyan he talks about Hastai ibn Shapirut he was a, more or less a contemporary uh, lived a bit after Hastai but he he says of him so Hastai ibn Shapirut that unique man of his generation the likes of whom could not be found amongst the servants of any other emperor in the world because of his high culture, the depth of his cunning, his sharp discernment, and his exceptional cleverness. Quite a high praise from you know, a Gentile to, to give to a Jewish diplomat. Let's continue with um, some of the big hitters here. So we've got um, Moses ben Maimon, aka Maimonides, um, and as also known the Rambam with an M at the end. Um, probably one of the, the biggest personalities, most well known personalities in. Um, the Jewish Golden Age of Spain. He was born initially in Cordoba in southern Spain but had to flee um, due to increasing persecution. Um, he fled initially um, to I think Morocco initially and then traveled around a bit with his family. It was quite a troubling time for the family and eventually settled in Egypt in a place called Fostat um, and there he became the physician to the Sultan Saladin. Uh, apart from his quite hectic medical schedule he also acted as a judge teacher and mediator for the local Jewish community. Interestingly, um, he never accepted payment for any of the religious services he gave. I'm not saying that it's you know not right and fair to accept you know um, payment for religious services as Jesus says um, you know a worker should receive his wages but um, his ideology was when it came to re religious stuff he didn't see it as something that should be like people should make money off Torah so he def didn't accept any um, payment for his services um, and look eventually it is said about him that he became quite exhausted and quite tired he had an extremely hectic schedule he probably slept six six hours a night and the rest of his day was either working um, you know being acting as judge and teacher and then doing his own study so you know non-stop he was really quite a you know he had quite a hectic schedule and that may have had some role in his early demise um, you know his legacy in Jewish philosophy and in scholarship is almost unparalleled. It said about him, from Moses to Moses, there was none like Moses. So really, really, um, you know, almost an unmatched um, legacy of Jewish learning. That's not to say he he wasn't without controversy. Um, he authored many works. His two most famous probably are um, include the Mishnah Torah, which is sort of a summary of of, of, sort of halakha, or sort of Jewish sort of practical law, day to day laws. And um, that was quite controversial in the sense that he didn't, he just gave his own summary without including references. So basically you have to take his word for it that he was telling the truth and that he was, knew what he was talking about. So um, a lot of the, his contemporaries criticized that. And also the Guide to the Perplexed um, he wrote, which is a philosophical work, which talks about a few things, but the thrust of it, he gives a very vicious defense of the non-corporality of God. So basically talk, saying how, you know, God you know, never shows, I mean, he, he according to him never shows himself in physical form it was always a spiritual invisible intangible form and he actually wasn't he was arguing with sort of a Muslim or Arab cult at the time which believed in the corporality of God so he was arguing with him 
And he was known for having a heavy um, sort of rationalistic bent, so influenced by Greek philosophy, especially Aristotle, so sort of downplaying the role of prophecy, downplaying the role of miracles. And that led to a great controversy in his lifetime and immediately afterwards, leading to actually some of his contemporaries um, you know, denouncing his work and banning his work, and even you know, contributing and burning his work as well. That's of course since um, with you know the Jewish establishment has matured since then, and he has a great place in our history. While people can be free to disagree with him on certain aspects of his philosophy. And next, um, our last per personality I will um, highlight is Moses ben Nachman, also known as Nachmanides or the Ramban with an N. <clears throat> he actually was towards the end of the Golden Age. He lived mostly in Christian Spain in a place called Girona in Aragon, which was would be today Catalonia, very close to Barcelona. He lived there pretty peacefully for most of his life, really, as a physician and a great Torah um, and you know Bible Talmud commentator. His commentaries are still well used today. That all changed uh, in 1263. He was 69 years old and he um, was compelled to um, debate a Jewish convert to Christianity named Pablo Cristiani. And it was called the Disputation of Barcelona because it was held in Barcelona. And essentially, I say compelled because he didn't want to debate. Oftentimes, I'll talk more about the dis disputations in my next video. But essentially, they were forced debates where the Christians compelled or downright forced Jewish people to, often leaders of the community or great rabbis, to debate with them. And or usually at a disadvantage to essentially not try and sort of really you know, seek the truth and flesh out who had the better faith or who was more correct, but essentially as tools of intimidation and ways to force conversions or pressure people to convert. So it, it was a political tool, not a you know honest intellectual tool. Um, this one was a bit different though. This one, you know, the, the king of Aragon, um, James I, he was quite tolerant of the Jews. So he promised um, the Ramban sort of freedom of speech. He would be allowed to, be allowed to say whatever he wanted which is actually quite unusual um, for the Middle Ages. Oftentimes in these debates, the Jews could not say anything which would offend the Christians. And of course, you know, um, if they couldn't say anything that offended the Christians, they couldn't really argue. But essentially he um, had to um, you know, debate this um, with um, this Jewish convert, Pablo Cristiani, and it revolved around sort of three main questions. The first question was whether the Messiah had come. The second question was whether he would be divine or a normal human. And the third one was whether Judaism or Christianity was correct in faith and deed. Um, now, essentially, the, the there are actually two accounts of this. Um, there's the one that Ramban apparently wrote, and the other one, which was a church-sanctioned version. They're both extant today, so you can actually read both of these. Um, I have a copy at home um, when you can actually read both of these accounts. Really, really interesting. The because they, they sort of give their own perspectives, but um, they the arguments more or less match. So you can actually try and study the arguments they use. It's actually really interesting. I don't have time to go through the arguments that they've used, but definitely worthwhile if you've got a bit of, a bit of time. Anyway, the, um, the Ramban won the respect of the court, won the respect of the king. He actually rewarded Ramban with a, a large donation of cash to his academy as a sign of his respect. Um, unfortunately, the um, church wrote an account which the Ramban sort of disagreed with and found offensive. He thought it was spreading lies, so he wrote his own account. Unfortunately, when he wrote his account, he was actually tried for that because he was given free freedom of speech during the debate, but he wasn't allowed to write things down. By writing things down, the Pope got involved and there was a, essentially a sham trial, but the king intervened on his behalf. The king demanded that he be present for all the proceedings, and the... King heard the Ramban's defense, which was essentially, he said that, you know, I, I did write down his account, but he wrote it down to try and preserve what he saw as the truth and to counteract the lies. And also he never actually included anything that he hadn't said during the, the debate, which was when he was given free speech. There was nothing new that he had written. And the king found that to be a just defense. However, because the church was agitating for it mostly, he sentenced the Ramban to a relatively light sentence of two years in exile to appease the church. However, um, as the church sort of continued to protest um, against the leniency of, of the sentence, they essentially changed it to a permanent exile. So he, again, this guy, you know, lived a relatively peaceful life. At 70, essentially he was a 70 year old man at this point. He was forced to leave his land. Really, you can, you know, just 
really think about if you know any of us who are, who are watching in our 70s who had to all of a sudden you know because of debates that we didn't actually want to participate and have to leave leave where we were you know you know the land we've known all our lives leave all our family he could he, had to, he couldn't take anyone with him so you know you gotta really feel for the rum bun here but he didn't waste his exile he went his way to the holy land um he um According to the tradition, he established a synagogue called the Ramban Synagogue, which is still in the old city in Jerusalem. You can visit it today. And he died in Akko in 1270 AD. And, um, yeah, I really hope we can have some sympathy for him. Um, we can see here, by the, by the end of the 13th century, the Golden Age was coming to an end, slowly, insidiously, but definitely um, coming to an end. And this verse comes to mind um, from Jeremiah 22, verse 10. Do not weep for the dead or mourn for him, but weep continually for the one who goes away, for he will never return or see his native land. It's essentially saying here, you know, weep for weep for the person who has to go into exile, which Ramban, you know, he, was, he, he sort of, in a way, ended his exile because he went back to the promised land, but he was definitely in exile personally from his family and his, you know, the land he knew all his life. So definitely you can feel for the Ramban here. Now, I want to ask an interesting question before we conclude. Is there, and the question is, is there biblical precedent for the Jews' success in exile? Because, um, you know, Jews, for, you know, the, the exile is supposed to be a punishment for the Jewish people um, for the sins. And Jews have had actually, you know, God's favor in exile, even though they've suffered persecutions, um, they actually have achieved quite a bit of success in exile, in particular with, this, with the exile in Spain. There, was, you know, there were many centuries where the Jews were very successful. So I guess my question is, is there a biblical precedent for this? And, you know, I'm not going to give a straight answer because I don't really know the answer to this. I'm going to say maybe, perhaps. And um, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any direct scriptural evidence for this, but I think there's a few parallels we can point to. Um, the story of Joseph, how, you know, he was sort of, he had to flee his family um, and he went to Egypt and he was given the gifts of prophecy and, you know, the gifts to sort of manage Egypt for the, um, for the Pharaoh. Um, he was blessed in his exile from his family. That, that's a, a parallel we can look at. I think the book of Daniel has a more direct parallel. Um, if you think about what it actually says about Daniel uh, and his um, contemporaries, it calls them youths without blemish, um, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. That's from chapter 1, verse 4. In verse 17 for the same chapter, it says, As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So interestingly, even though you know the exile being referred to here, the Babylonian exile, was a punishment for the Jewish nation, Daniel, who was seen as worthy, was actually, you know, and his contemporaries were, were blessed quite supernaturally with you know gifts that they could use to um, you know serve God, serve the people where they were, and you know, um, you know, be honored and be and, you know, enjoy success. So I think that you know that's an interesting parallel with the, um, with the Spanish exile as well. And I'm also reminded in terms of spiritual truths we can learn from the exile about how the New Testament uses exile to teach us about these truths. Whether we are physically at home or in exile on earth, really we believers are all exiles when it comes to our true home, which is, you know, since the Messiah redeems us is heaven actually. Heaven's our true home now. And, I, and as a result, we cannot get too comfortable on earth. And there's a few places in the New Testament which talks about this really well, which really explains it quite clearly. I'm just going to quote a few of these verses from 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. From Philippians 3 verse 20, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, from the book of Hebrews 13 verse 14, For here we have no lasting city on earth, but we seek a city that is to come. So, um, I mean, I, I really found that you know, it's, it's useful to sort of compare the truths so that we can sort of learn from these practical events in history. So I hope you enjoy that. That's, that's um, my very, very brief summary of the Golden Age. I, I hope that was interesting and, and useful to people. Um, and I guess it, it was, you know, the Jews are reminded here that, um, we are all reminded really that we are destined to wander in exile. Um, and while in the exile, even though, you know, God does give us success and does give us blessing, eventually we are doomed to wander around. So next time when we actually come back to it, I'm going to be talking about how 
um, you know, essentially the, the how the golden age came to an end, the, the worsening situation for Iberian Jews over the couple of centuries before the expulsion, and you know, really try and um, get into that story and sort of capture the you know quite really serious tragedy um, which occurred to the Jewish people. It was really quite a fall from grace. So I'll leave it there. Um, thank you very much for joining me in, in this rush today. And I hope you enjoy it.